That, that's me, your lighthearted host and expressionist. And this, this is my podcast, Love and Lies. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Love and Lies podcast. And I am your host, MJ Mangus. And today I am talking to, what name are we going to give you today? Um, Melissa. Melissa. And Melissa is a former student and she is going to share with us what it is really like to be a college girl. And so we hear lots of stories uh, that imply kind of like girls gone wild, um, college girls gone wild, that sort of stuff. True? True. True. Okay. So we're going to talk about the pressure. We're going to talk about the parties. We're going to talk about the drinking. We are going to talk about the sex because there's a lot of sex. (laughs) And I'm really excited about this uh, because this touches on an area that um, goes into like love and sex addiction. And I love raising awareness on this because I we're living in a love and sex and addiction epidemic and um, so it, this just the information. This is I'm not diagnosing anything. Uh, this is not even a session between Melissa and I. It is just we're talking, but it gives us an opportunity to talk about behavior patterns and um, and that helps us in life. So I'm just here to give the information. But uh, I identify with with. Um, I think a lot of girls are going to identify with your story, Melissa. I don't think you have to be in college, but uh, I think it's this this uh, time frame in a woman's life. Let's hear it from the beginning. I want to talk about high school. So you were a virgin all through high school? Um, until the end of it. Until the end of it. And then you lost your virginity. And how did you lose your virginity? Um, it was with a family friend who I hadn't seen in a few years. And I don't know, I was just embarrassed, which I shouldn't have been looking back now, but I was, but I was kind of one of the only people that I knew that was still a virgin. And one day I just decided I was, I was going to do it. I had never even had my first kiss. And I said, you know what, I'm going to do all of it. And this guy had actually DM'd me to try and catch up um out of the blue yes out of the blue and (laughs) I thought you know what this is perfect I'm I'm gonna do it and I did um a couple nights later he picked me up and you know in his car and I we he drove up the street just a little bit not even far from where I live like a mile or did he just got, no, did he pull no, up in front of the neighbors? And we got in the back seat and I had my first kiss. I lost my virginity, everything for the first time. All in five minutes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fairly fast. <laughs> I hope the listeners aren't mad that we're laughing about that because when you lose your virginity, it's supposed to be something supposed to be something special. <laughs> exactly. And um, the reality of that is that I, you know, that doesn't typically happen, but a girl absolutely has gets to make the decision, the choice when this happens. And, um, and so you, you get to choose it and that's what you chose, but there was peer pressure. That's what I'm hearing. Yeah. yeah. Because that's the other girls crazy. in college or the girls in high school had already lost their virginity around what? Ninth grade, 10th grade. Um, yeah, around, I'd say 11th grade. Wow. Okay. So it was in 11th grade. They, you know, they had some of them even in eighth grade. I don't know. Wow. Okay. Uh, all right. So this is guy number one. Mm-hmm. All right. And now we are off to college and yes. what happens? You, you go, you decide that you're going to actually change your your personality or who you are or how you identify with yourself uh tell me a little bit about that because i think other people other girls you know new beginnings you have this opportunity so tell me about that yeah in high school i mean all throughout 
my life. Um, my dad passed away when I was in third grade. And from then on, I just had major social anxiety, a lot of uh, depression, and I would not want to get out of bed ever. I would go to school and then I'd go home and I'd get back in bed and I would stay in bed until I had to go to school the next day for, you know, eight years, I, about, I don't know how many years it was. But when I was going off to college, I said to myself, this is your time. You don't like your life. You're not happy. You don't make yourself happy. So I'm going to do it all. You know, I'm, I decided I was going to have the, the friend group that I love. I was I was going to be the cool girl. I was going to be the party girl. You know, I, I was going to be confident. I wanted everybody to think I was confident and I had everything together. And that's kind of where it came from. So you just make this choice. You have this, you know, this this talk with yourself. And then I I find it incredible that you just walk into that. Yeah, I, I did do it. And it took a couple months probably for me to actually turn into that person. But I realized that I can just decide to be whatever makes me happy. I can decide to live my life however I am happy. And I really did become that confident girl. I made all kinds of friends. And I really enjoyed myself. I was I was the girl that got all the party invites because I was just <laughs> I, I, energetic and fun and I really loved who I was becoming. Wow, that's incredible. So this is like your alter ego and then it creates this reality, this world that you step into. So if, if there was a moment where you felt insecure or you were you know, hesitant to pursue something, you were like, wait a minute, that's not me anymore. I'm making myself do this. Exactly. I'm going to do it. Yeah. For a while, I would still get, you know, shaky hands when I was walking into a party <laughs> or talking to someone new, but it all kind of went away. And I think this did lead to me trying to feed my ego instead of trying to become happy, trying to make myself happy and content. And that's where I got confused. I still do really resonate with this change that I made for myself. And I feel like I still live by it a lot, but I just got off track of, I, I got confused about what was making me really happy about who I was becoming. Well, the ego will absolutely do that to you. And, but it is fascinating that how we can portray ourselves to other people and you can spoon feed people who you are and they just believe it. There's a lot of power in that, you know, that can, people can use that to manipulate or people can say, you know, no, this is who I am. This is what I want you to believe that I am and who I want to be. And so people do. So people all around you are like, she's cool. She's confident. Uh, she's, you know, all put together and I want to hang around with you. And so you exuded this energy and, um, and it was confident. And so now you're attracting guys. And so there's this uh, second guy. This was this the the cute one. Oh, yeah, this was the one you dated for a year for the first year, right? Oh, there was um, my first year of college. I met the first guy who I we never dated, but we hooked up a few times a week, I would say, for probably the rest of the year. And you were faithful to him, but even though you weren't in a relationship, that was the one you wanted. Yeah. You were like obsessed with him. Or I, I was not faithful <laughs> to him, but he was my favorite. <laughs> right. Okay. So you were, this was the guy you had the little obsession with. Yeah. Every girl has a crush, a, an obsession. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. So we go through him for the first year. Then the second year, we meet Guy three this is the boyfriend yes the boyfriend okay and tell me about that this is where i met you you came in to the platinum spray tan there's always a shout out for platinum and my heart melted for you um you looked sad you seemed like your mind was on something and so i asked you you know so what do you you know 
what do you got going on? And that you, you were very open with me and you just shared, you know, that you were trying to make yourself feel better, that you were coming out of a relationship with this guy that was an asshole and that, um, you know, that's, that's where you were at. And so where, tell me about that. We dated for, we technically dated for about six months, but it was around a year. We were spending every night together, every day together, grocery shopping, everything. We got really serious, really fast. I think we were just coming out of COVID. So I think that kind of played a role Mm -hmm. in, we were all isolating so much for a little while that we were so happy to find someone we kind of liked at least, or we thought we were in love with whatever <laughs> and Connection. to spend all of our time with. Exactly. Yeah. But we, what we ended up drinking together almost every night and it would turn into really bad fights, just yelling at each other all the time constantly all all of my friends thought I was crazy for staying with him for so long and it it was it was a tough year I I thought I was happy but I think I was just as sad as I had been prior years prior there was a lot of verbal abuse with him uh didn't even get physical correct no. Did not get physical, but there was a lot of verbal uh, and emotional abuse. Tell me about yeah. that. Um, he would make me feel really bad about things that I opened up to him to him about. Like, for example, I got sexually assaulted in high school and I told him in confidence I trusted him. And his response at the time was, oh, I'm, yeah, I'm so sorry. That's terrible. But then the next night when we were drinking, he brought it up to me as, you're so stupid. You got raped in high school. It's because you're such a slut. You dress so ter- you dress like a slut. You act just terrible. I don't know. It said a lot of really terrible things about me. And it was constantly things like this. Anytime I would open up to him about something, he would find a way to use it against me. Um, it it was really tough for me looking back at it now, especially I really regret how I put up with so much and I let him do that to me. And then I would apologize after I would be the one to apologize always after he would say these awful things. I would run back to him like, I'm so sorry, babe, please take me back. I know I'm terrible. I need your help. Fix me, save me, help me, whatever. The whole nine yards. Did you stay around because now that's codependency. So did you stick around because you thought that like he was going to change or you you were had to make him happy all the time. You were willing to sacrifice your own happiness. I didn't even realize that it was wrong how he was treating me until after the fact. I, at the time, just thought I was this shitty, terrible person and everything was wrong with me and he was right about everything he said. And I felt like I needed to change myself in order for anybody to want me, for anybody to love me. You thought that that, that you needed to change for anybody. He convinced you of that? Yes, correct. Were you... um... So this was actually your first like real relationship, right? Yes, it was. Okay. So uh, there is, I'm going to, just for the listeners, because this kind of topples into the area about the love addiction uh, and, and this codependency, which people, a lot of people are in. So a love addiction, and just tell me if you agree. Uh, love addiction. Well, agree that this was your experience. Love addiction. You often put up with unhealthy behaviors such as cheating, physical or verbal abuse, 
codependency, you may be convinced that you can change your partner. Love addiction, the relationship is rooted in feelings of insecurity and low self-esteem and fear of rejection, which sounds like you were, that's really what was going on for you, the fear of rejection. And codependency, the person loses a sense of themselves and focuses completely on the needs of the other partner. And that sounds like that's what was going on with you too. Definitely. And the becoming codependent is a part of love addiction. So they go hand in hand. Um, So you're with this guy and now this is your second year in college. Mm -hmm. And this is guy number three. Mm -hmm. And then this is where the next time that I see you. And you come in and now uh, you aren't hurt anymore. You are determined. (laughs) (laughs) And you, I think you were just, you were going out to a party and you were on the hunt. You were ready. You were determined. You were going to get over this person. You were just, um, you were on your way. And uh, at this point, this is where your count starts. How many people have you had sex with after this? You had, how many people have you sex with total? Total, I would say around 30. I don't totally know. After I would say hopefully 20. Okay. And so that we have the first three guys and then now this is the this is you're going into your third year and this is where all the parties are going to happen and all of that stuff. So tell me about the parties, the drinking, the drugs, how would your day start out or your evening or what were the parties like? I mean, frat um, hearts, frat parties and bars and all of that. Yeah, I would say the frat parties were definitely where I started to think I found my my place. I, it sounds crazy, but I thought that's what I was here for, partying. And it started out as, you know, I would be home 2 a.m. And then it, it kept going on and on. I would be home, you know, 6 a.m. And towards the end of my time partying, it was, I was getting home at, or two days later, you know, I, it would just be constant. Um, it really, it really snowballed into an issue that I thought was not an issue. I thought it was something great, something that was fun, something that made me cool, something that made people like me. And there were, there's countless times where I, I know I did something, but I don't remember any of it. I have weeks where I don't remember an entire week of my life or just over the summer, I have a week that I don't remember. And I do remember waking up in a different state and being confused as to why I was in a different state than I remembered being in. I called my sister even, and I said, please check my location. I don't know what state I'm in. I'm in a hotel. I have no idea what's going on. Wow. So this was, are you, you're doing drugs and drinking? Um, this was actually only drinking, um, but there, there was a lot of other stuff involved as well. Nothing, n- nothing really, really hard. Just like um, cocaine, probably. There was some Molly in there, you know. All right. So yeah. you're drinking. You're blacking out. You're having a good time, and then you're waking up, and you're like, "Where am I at?" Exactly. Uh, so when you're on this like pursuit of finding your power, right. Mm -hmm. And to get over this guy, this is where I think a lot of girls can identify when your heart is broken and you're seeking, um, it doesn't even have to be revenge, but just to feel better, you tend to find your um, comfort or uh, confidence in yourself in sex with guys or trying to go meet a guy or whatever the case may be. 
so you wake up and you're determined like you're going to go out and you're going to find a guy and you're just going to sleep with them. Or was it something that you were just partying and then you accidentally just slept with somebody or just slept with somebody? Or was it where, uh, you know, like, like you wake up and you know, we talked about that where you kind of wake up and you're like, tonight I'm going to go out and I'm going to fucking sleep with somebody. I'm, I'm going to find somebody. I'm going to sleep with them. And that's, that's really as far as you get in your mind. But that's what you decide that you're going to do. I would say it was definitely that one. We would go out with our, all of our friends, but there was always something. I don't know if it was the same for everybody else that I know, but there was always something in my mind that it wasn't even a second thought. It was just, I thought that's how the night was supposed to go. I go out, I get super drunk, I go home with someone. or if there's no one to go home with, then I don't go home. I, you know, I, I stay out. I keep partying until I either desperately need to sleep or until I do find someone. So it's like, you know, it doesn't matter what they look like. It doesn't matter how much money they make. It doesn't matter, you know, what they're wearing. It's just like, you're going to connect with somebody and, and that's what you're waiting for. So when you walk into the party, you're walking around you're looking for somebody and then then you see the one and it's not the one but it's the one you're going to sleep with for the night exactly <laughs> and it, it was that's interesting it. oh i apologize no go ahead um it was interesting it, i would even get possessive over that i i could have not spoken to them i could have just seen them out of the corner of my eye and mm -hmm. in my brain i would think Mm -hmm. they're not allowed to talk to any girls the rest of the night they're mine tonight i never want to see them again after but tonight mine it was really interesting it, it was almost fueling my ego as well to not just to make me feel better that they want me but to make me feel like they're going to choose me over everybody else up here right yeah that's the power trip the control you you set out to overpower somebody and use sex to do it and you feel better and stronger and empowered and this is kind of this is de definitely called cruising when you when you go out and you're and this is your mindset you're gonna exactly what i said overpower somebody use sex manipulate um to to satisfy this this part in you that is hurting that makes you feel better makes the ego and numbs the pain kind of thing and mm -hmm. so you're just walking around trying to find somebody and then you meet them and then this possession over them is this con controlled trip also this possession over them actually is a high do you agree mm -hmm. definitely However, you can manipulate the situation, but it's almost like they are, uh, you know, this toy. You really don't take it serious. Like you said, you don't, you don't ever want to see them again, but tonight. Exactly. You're mine. Uh, the building self-esteem through sexual behavior is a real thing. And, but this um, really has to kind of be, doesn't have to be coupled with alcohol or drugs but people get their courage from drugs and alcohol yeah and definitely. so would you have done would you have chose these things without the drugs or without the alcohol I don't know I I don't think I would have because it honestly took me a long time to ever have sex without being drunk Mm -hmm. And I still, even now, I'll get nervous about if I'm going to have sex with someone. I get nervous that I'm not blackout drunk because I, I get too much in my head. And I think, you know, they're going to see my body. They're going to see things that are wrong with me. They're, they're going to think I'm ugly. They're going to, you know, just little things that guys would never notice. But I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, I'm bloated today. He's not going to ever want to talk to me again because of it. and. That's something that I'm still working on, and i'm I'm gonna need to get over eventually, but 
it was, yeah, it definitely, the alcohol numbed all of that. I didn't ever give any of that a second thought. So when you were drunk, you felt like you were the sexiest woman in the room. Yeah. And usually I wasn't, especially if I'm drunk. I have, you know, mascara under my eyes. I I look sloppy. (laughs) My hair would get frizzy and curly. Like, I don't know how. I I would look at myself in the mirror every time I came home from partying and I would just be like, oh my goodness, how do you look like this? I would look just disheveled and broken down by life. It was, yeah, it was funny, laughable. So um, you're in AA right now, right? Yeah. And do you feel like that took place in school? Like that developed in school? I would say it got much worse. While I was at school, um, there's always some kind of either frat event or bar event or club open to go to. So it did definitely worsen it. But I think I've had all of these issues my whole life or maybe not my whole life. I think I had a big change, a big mental change when my dad passed away. But at least since then, that I have... Now, moving to college, I just had a medium to let it out. Addictions um, happen from escaping from emotional discomfort. Exactly. And it may have seemed like it was the boyfriend that you were trying to seek revenge on or trying to cope with or trying to heal from, but it was actually something else probably losing your father that put you in the state to even choose that boyfriend because we attract whoever we're with reflects what's going on inside of us exactly it's like a mirror so um people out there listening whoever you're with is a reflection of how you feel about yourself inside And so you picked him because of, you know, we already had some experience, some trauma in your childhood, stress, anxiety, uh, obviously depression, loneliness, shame, even boredom will cause us to start picking up some coping mechanism and that can turn into some sort of addiction or whatever. But obviously you were trying to numb the pain and most of the pain and discomfort comes from our childhood not not necessarily that's saying that that's happened to you but a lot of us have trauma in our childhood and it comes up later on in our relationships or even we're not dating anybody but our relations and we're just living out and we're just we're all doing the best we can with what we've got from where we're at um you had mentioned the guy that put you on his social media or added you as a friend. And I wanted to talk about this because I think this is the thing. I'm not sure. And if it is, I just, for, for girls out there, um, I don't know if this is a way that guys kind of get girls, but using social media platforms. So if somebody has a lot of followers, they will in front of you because it's happened to somebody else. They told me about this. And then you said it, and I'm like, this has to be something that they do. And it is where they add you while you're standing, they meet you. They add you, with, they ask you guys do the social media, you know, I'll follow you, you follow me. They follow you in front of you. So you see mm-hmm. now that they're following you, you think that you have connected with somebody cool or whatever. And then you have sex with them and then they unfollow you. Yes, this this did happen to me. But I really think, Melissa, I think this is what guys use as a way to sleep with the girl. I think they they can use their their social media. This may sound so, it, it may sound crazy, but since a couple people have now said this to me, I wonder if this is something that guys will do. If they have a, a following that that makes a girl feel accepted, wanted, and then 
they like the guy or decide that they're going to be with the guy. And then the guy knows automatically that he's just going to, whether they sleep with him or not, he knows that he's just going to unfollow like the next day. Uh huh. So that- to clarify, I apologize. To clarify, the um, I did hook up with a TikTok famous guy, but I mm-hmm. thought it was so cool and so great that I never even wanted to bring up the fact that he was famous. He brought it up, but I would just shoot it down anytime he mentioned it. Because did you I know when so you cool. met him that that's who he was? <laughs> I did. And I thought I was so cool and above it all that, and he would think I was so cool and above it all because I just didn't want to talk about it and I didn't care. But that's different than the guy who added me on Snapchat and then blocked me right after we had sex. <laughs> so, wait a minute, you're telling me. <laughs> so you're saying that you had sex with a, a TikTok famous dude? I did. Um, But then you also had exactly what I was talking about happen. You had sex with a guy that added you, you had sex with him, then he unfollowed you. Yes. And he he wasn't famous or anything. He he didn't have, I don't even know who he is, to be honest. I don't know what his name is. Wow. Okay. So he just, uh, okay. All right. So I just want to put that out there just in case and go. So if some guy is like, has a lot of followers and they're saying, and they want to follow you, just don't fa- think past it or don't fall for it. Or, you know, I don't know, but I think something tells me that, 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 that might be up the guys. It might be a part of their, um, you know, uh, Oh, I would say it's a part of their <laughs> game. for <laughs> Definitely. Okay. And so what is going on with, your friends what are the other girls doing i mean are they partying and having sex are any of your girlfriends actually talking to you about any of their feelings or their insecurities or is everybody walking around acting like they've got all their shit together that they're confident that you know what what is everybody else doing yeah, um, I would say most of us, I do have a couple close friends that we would talk to each other about more about what we were feeling. But for the most part, my whole little friend, <clears throat> I apologize, my whole little friend group that I had made, most of us would not talk to each other about our feelings because I do think there was that sense of competition there between the girls everybody wanting to seem like they have their life together and judging each other for whatever they think you're doing wrong. So they would judge you or everybody Mm -hmm. for what they think that you're doing wrong. And so you're living up to trying to live up to their expectations or the standard. Yeah. At the same time, we were all pretty much doing the same thing but again there are a couple that we're not but we're all pretty much doing the same thing and I'd like to say that I don't judge anyone and I haven't and I always try not to but I'm sure I was not perfect in these years so I, I'm sure that I played the game as well but I it felt like the other girls in this friend group were for the most part, very judgmental and I could never live up to their expectations of what I should do. And that almost pushed me towards acting out more, just being wild more to spite them. Were they um, bragging about that they slept with so-and-so? Yeah. And so going out and getting drunk and laughing off that you don't remember the night and you know, I gotta say everybody's done this. Oh my God. If you're, if (laughs) this is just, you know, everybody's done this. Let's be Uh honest. Everybody, everybody's, everybody's had a wild night. At least you should (laughs) have a wild night, (laughs) but that feeling of, Oh my God, I can't believe I did it. And your emotional maturity is different. So you're still processing information and you think that it's cool and you don't realize the damage and you do laugh it off. And then 
you go out and drink again because you're trying to numb, you know, we either you're, you're, you're still going with the flow and your ego and your environment and the peer pressure, Mm -hmm. or you feel really bad about yourself because of what you've done. But the only way to really um, deal with that is to drink again and go out and do it again. Exactly. And that's what you did. Yes, constantly. Right. Men that are supposed to have a have sexual addiction behavior, I'll put it that way, has an average of 32 sex partners and women have an average of 22. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> I just wanted to say that. <laughs> Tell me your lowest low. My lowest low was what we were kind of just talking about, about the guy who, well, I went to a frat party. I'll start here. And it was my freshman year and I lost my dorm key at this frat party and my roommates wanted to go home, but I wanted to stay. And I ended up losing my dorm key after they had left. So I just kind of had this, oh, crap moment where I realized it was gone. And then I was just, I was on the prowl. I was going to find someone. I was going to find somewhere to sleep. And I found one of the guys who lived in that house. He was older. I believe he was a senior at the time. He added me on Snapchat. And you can change your name on Snapchat. And I think he gave me a fake name. So it comes up as something else in your account. Mm -hmm. And I think he did. (laughs) I don't know. Um, I I still have no idea. But he said, don't worry. You can sleep here. You know, my room's there. Once the party's over, we'll go in my room. And we did. We hooked up. And then after, he said, okay, you can sleep on the couch in the living room. (laughs) And... I did. I went out into the living room and I slept on the couch only to wake up to the front door opening and pledges piling in by the dozen. So dozens of these young frat boys that were my age. Some of them I even knew from high school. It was mortifying. And I just looked like that girl who just didn't make it home from the party. I was I had stains all over me. I think people had spilled on me. My hair had gotten frizzy. It was, it was a mess. And I felt really embarrassed. And so I ordered an Uber home or back to my dorm. And I helped them clean up for, you know, the five, 10 minutes I was waiting there for my Uber to come. I didn't know what else to do. Mm -hmm. So I helped them clean from the party. And then finally, my Uber was there. And I said to myself, thank God, I really just want to get out of here. And I walked out to my Uber and a boy that I knew was getting out of it to go clean up more. It it was mortifying. It was one of my worst experiences. When you talk about going and um, sleeping on the couch, what were you thinking when that was going? What were you saying to yourself? Because this is also a moment that a lot of girls have where you've just done something that you're not proud of. You thought it was going to go another way. Somebody treats you differently. You feel really bad about yourself. And yeah, no, go ahead. Um, It was a really bad feeling. I don't remember it completely because I, sir, I was just wasted, but I do remember walking over to the couch and just thinking about how embarrassed I was. I even remember thinking about what are his roommates going to think in the morning if I don't wake up before them. And then what I never imagined happened, dozens and dozens of boys saw me. It it was, it, it felt, I felt very unwanted and like he couldn't have just let me sleep in his bed. It wasn't that much to ask for I'll, and I had said to him I need somewhere to sleep and he said yeah you can sleep in my room but it felt like he just kind of chewed me up and spit me out and then he blocked me <laughs> did you ever see this guy again 
No, maybe I wouldn't even be able to recognize him. I, I know he had brown hair and that's about it, but so does almost every guy. <laughs> <Right. laughs> so I might have seen him again. I just have no idea. Um, out of curiosity, what did you do that next night? Did you go out and do oh, it again? I, yes, I did. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, to numb that. Pain. I made sure I had a dorm key, though. I tied it to my shoelace <laughs> after that point. You tied it to your shoelace. I did. That was that was my 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 hack that I thought was absolutely ingenious. But one time I did end up losing my shoes. Oh so Lord! I had to do it again. <laughs> I know that there are listeners that can totally relate to what you are saying. <laughs> And why I'm laughing is because I can relate to it too. Yeah. Um, everybody has some sort of story, but sometimes you just go through a season and you're obviously going through something. Uh, but okay. So y- you go out and you do it again the next night. Uh, mm-hmm. Give me your lowest or your highest high. My highest high at the time, again, it's looking back, it's all just terrible to me. It's not terrible. I, I do have good friends out of it, but it is all things I wish I hadn't done. But my highest high at the time was that TikTok famous guy. Really? I was so excited. Yes. I thought it was, I thought it was amazing. And I also was, was he good in bed? Excited. I'm sorry. Was he good in bed? Uh, no. <laughs> I would say people with that, guys like that, they, uh, they, all they rely on is their, their platform. And they're like, I don't have to be good in bed. I can, I, you know, I don't have to be good at what I do. I don't have to pay any attention to her, basically. And she wants me. Which it's So wait a minute. Okay. Wait. So what did he do? Just like literally bend you over? Did you give him a blow job? Like what happened? How does he, how does he, how does that happen? Tell me about well, that. We were at, uh, we, we were at his mansion or not mansion part. It was penthouse party at one of the apartment buildings in Tempe. And I decided again with the possession thing, I looked at him when we walked in, I was like, he's mine for sure. And I did end up talking to him all night and I kind of feel bad about this. I'm, I completely made up a personality. I, <laughs> I made up a whole life story about myself. I thought it was interesting for me to be someone else for the night. And so he honestly has no idea any of the actual truth about me. Um, but wait, what did you tell him? <laughs> I told him, Oh, I, I told him all this stuff about, I, I was, self-made and I don't know my I, I paid my my way through college even though I don't I don't know why I lied about it I I I don't know but he thought I was just the most incredible person he's ever met and he's like and why is that key tied to your shoes <laughs> <laughs> um what's the story of the key <laughs> Yeah. So anyway, my friends and I, my roommates and I at the time, we thought it was such a win because he left his own party before it was over to drive wow. us out and come home with us. And I just remember it was, we were all so excited. They were, you know, we cheered about it the next morning. Um, but he, he walked into our apartment, which it was just a small college apartment. It was it was normal. It wasn't the penthouse. And I remember him saying to us, "Wow, it's so cozy. It looks so easy to clean." <laughs> and I can't say something really nice, so, but I can't I can't pick great guys. Clearly. <laughs> well, when you're drunk, <laughs> I, yeah, he was the most fantastic guy in the room at the time. Oh my gosh, I so. We were, we were all very excited about it. Okay. So, so tell me, so what is he got like five minutes? He leaves the car running. What happens? Um, He did stay the night actually. He was actually a nice guy. Okay. Um, He did stay the night. I, 
he messages me every once in a while just out of nowhere it'll be the most random thing like I'll have something on my snapchat story a picture of my dog and he'll message me I don't know it's so I you were good in bed, to- and he sucked. <laughs> I think, honestly, he does try to be a good guy. That's his kind of TikTok persona. Okay. So I think it's mostly he's trying to stop Spread the word. everyone from, yeah, he's trying to stop anyone from spreading that, you know, oh, he slept with me and then never talked to me again. Mm, okay. That's a good tactic. It is. It works because I think he's a nice guy. (laughs) (laughs) If he was listening to this, that is so funny. He'd be like, I suck in bed. (laughs) (laughs) And you didn't have the heart to tell him. Oh, gosh. Um, All right. So let me ask you, wait, so threesomes, any uh, anything else? Um, nothing besides threesomes. I, um, I'm not a couple or yeah, a couple, I think. Um, what was the shortest? Huh? Sorry, go ahead. What was the shortest? Okay. So everybody, she's had a couple threesomes. Were those, uh, would you, how do you, how do you feel about those? Um, regret, shame. One in particular, I'm thinking about, I, one, I was on vacation, so I kind of just don't count it. Okay. I don't know if that's mm. healthy or not, but <laughs> one was with two of my good friends. The guy I had hooked up with a couple times, and the girl had also hooked up with him a couple times. And one night we were all together at his house, and we were just kind of looking at each other like, which one is going to hook up with him? <laughs> and this friend, this girlfriend, she's one of the nicest people I know, the least judgmental people. Both of us are just kind of. I think we can relate about how we knew this entire time that we were in a bad place, but we just didn't want to do anything about it. So she she's hilarious. It wasn't a competition at all. So we didn't compete with each other. We were just kind of like, oh, what do we do now? And then it just turned into, oh, well, like we could both hook up with him at the same time. And then we all win. And he was excited <laughs> and you were drunk um, so, yeah exactly so it was it was a really easy experience honestly I, always, I always had a rule of I'm never gonna have a threesome with one of my friends let alone two it just would make it weird what if they preferred one of us mm-hmm. you know I it would be weird but it wasn't weird I remember us the entire time Kara, so sorry I remember us the entire time looking at each other and laughing <laughs> about how saying to each other it should be weird why isn't this weird this is funny this is cool it's regular like we didn't think anything was off and it didn't make our friendship weird at all either and I, <laughs> the funniest part was he the guy who he it was his house we were at and he ended up sleeping on the couch and me and my girlfriend <laughs> slept, slept in, in his, his bed, bed. Oh, he was a gentleman. One Direction music all night. So now I can't honestly listen to One Direction (laughs) music without being like, oh, I remember that one night. (laughs) Oh my God. You don't know to turn it up or turn it down. (laughs) What is the fastest time that you had sex with somebody? Shortest amount of time. Shortest amount of time. It was probably with, I think it was guy number three, uh, the boyfriend. He, when he would if he would be gone for a weekend or something, he would come back and it would literally be like 30 seconds. Well, no, I mean, without knowing them walking into oh, a party so and then wow. having sex with them. I see. I understand. I apologize. <laughs> I couldn't keep my so, hands off of him. That's what happens when you're obsessed with somebody. <laughs> guys who are fast. It's more of a compliment, honestly. Right. Um, when they're fast, but anyways, the shortest amount of time knowing them, I'm, I can't place a specific memory, but I know that I've done this multiple times where I've walked up to someone, said, do you want to have sex with me? And then we just kind of left. Okay. So that's pretty short. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. I mean, you're not going and talking and and getting to know each other. You're. 
Okay. I, I think it came from me wanting to just secure him because if he was, you know, a cuter guy at a bar or at a party or whatever. <laughs> that's that's one way to get like, rid of the competition. Someone's going to steal him. I'm going to grab him now. <laughs> that's how you get rid of the competition right exactly (laughs) i'm just laughing because there's a lot of um you know your mind you're just (laughs) just how you think uh you know this there's just a lot of truth in what you're saying. A lot of people are going to be able to relate to it if they're being honest. Doesn't mean you have to have slept with 30 men and you could have slept with 100 men. It doesn't matter. You could slept with what, two men. But, you know, these experiences you can, people can relate to if it's one drunken night or if it's a couple of drunken nights or whatever the case may be. And you're walking it through it. You're walking us through it and I'm and you're painting the pictures. And But let me ask you this. Do you? You did you were you enjoying the sex? Let's be really. No. I didn't think that you were. This is a total no, fucking power all. trip, you guys. She wasn't mm-hmm. enjoying the sex. It was just the power. I bet you enjoyed the power. You weren't I even did. into the sex. Definitely. I don't. No, I wasn't at all. When you are that age. Not a lot of girls, and I say this with much love and no judgment, but I don't mm-hmm. think at that age people really know how to have sex so much. Yeah. You're you're maybe you've been having it for a couple of years, but it's unless you're like in a relationship and you've grown with somebody, but if there's this pattern of kind of like you know, having sex with it, you don't have that opportunity to really and just the age uh itself. So not that I'm not saying everybody this age can't have sex, that nobody's good. I don't want anybody to, you know, think that. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying typically. And 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 even with all women, you don't necessarily always enjoy sex. And and there are women that are out at a bar and they go home and they have sex with somebody and they're not enjoying the sex, but they're doing it for the connection. They're doing it for the power. They're doing it to feel better. Uh, a lot of girls even think if they have sex with somebody and they fuck their brains out, that that's going to make that person like them. That's another power trip. Um, that's another pattern. It's not necessarily true, but it, so you're having all of this sex and these guys aren't pleasing you nor, and I'm going to guess that you're not even trying to really get off. You're just, trying to have sex with them exactly. and be done with it. Yeah. I I just would want it to be over. I can't count how many times I would be there doing it and being like, please just hurry up, just hurry up, just, just finish already. You know, I, I just would want it to be over. Yeah. So you wanted it to be over, but you you're drunk you, you want to have sex with somebody you want to feel empowered you want to feel better then when it happens the actual act of it is not doing anything for you you want it to be done and then what happens sets in um then like the shame are you just like oh my god yeah, I can, why do i keep doing shame. this exactly but also Somehow at the same time, okay, how do, what am I going to do next? Does it feel like you're pretending? Definitely. Like you're faking everything. Yeah. It, at some point. But then you feel I, big. Exactly. At some point I let that, that new persona that we were talking about mm-hmm. take over me and it almost felt like I was now playing a character instead of deciding to change who I was. Like I, I came into it with good intentions. I wanted to be happy with myself. I wanted to be confident. I wanted to love myself, but it turned into, this isn't who I am. And I don't, I feel like I'm playing a character and I'm not being who being myself. Now you're getting depressed. Yeah. So, um, 
there's also this part where I think you have an idea of what sex is supposed to feel like and act like, and you know, uh, what it's supposed to be like. And then when you even have sex, then you're discouraged, disappointed. You feel awkward. You really don't know uh, what's going on. If they've enjoyed it, the communication, you're not talking to that person. And then it's like, you feel bad. You feel, you feel good for the moment. I think because they chose you like mm-hmm. to, like you go and you say, okay, that's the guy. And because they decide that they're going to, it seems like they're going to go with you and this is going to go down. I think that is what makes you feel good about yourself. Mm-hmm. And after that, that's you, you feel really bad about yourself. I, I it's mm-hmm. not, it's not having sex that makes you feel good. I think it's just them choosing you is what's making you feel wanted. Definitely. And you only feel good for that moment. Yeah. I think even towards the end of this, I don't know, era, I, friends would make fun of me because I started, I think I started to realize I wasn't enjoying it, but I would still want to be the one that they chose. So I, everybody, it was a running joke with us that I would go home with guys and then not hook up with them. Right. Because you just like, wanted to be picked. Exactly. Either pretend to fall asleep, which I did a lot, or I don't know, pretend to be too drunk and pretend I couldn't walk. I I would, it sounds it's, crazy talking about it, but I knew I didn't want to at this point. And, but for some reason, I just still wanted to win. Ah, win. Mm-hmm. That's the truth. That's like, you're, yeah, you're in a battle mm-hmm. with yourself. It's you versus you, but you really take, you talk about you know, taking somebody out of the competition and the girls and you would be protective over them, protective over them. You are doing it for the win. You want to win. And that's what it's all about. That, that was giving you a sense of Mm self-worth and wow. Um, Were the other girls, they were doing this too still, right? Yeah. So when you give yourself away, the listeners, you uh, experience anxiety and sadness, regret, depression, embarrassment, poor self-esteem when you just give yourself away like that, even if you win. And I think the, the winning part is what's making you feel like you have uh, some worth there's this, you know, competition and you won, like you're good enough. Like mm-hmm. you were good enough. I'm good enough. Right? Exactly. So the cycle of addiction for the listeners is uh, an emotional one. Then there is a trigger. Then there is a craving, a ritual. Mm-hmm. And then there is guilt. Yep, that's spot on. I had never heard that, but that is spot mm-hmm. on. And your ritual was, you know, using the sex, but I think more so like you were craving being picked. You were craving not even the attention, I don't even think. Mm-hmm. It's just being picked. Exactly. When you started adding up the people that you have slept with, were you secretly feeling a high off of, okay, that's 16. Okay. That's 18. Yes. I've slept with 22 guys. I have no idea. I still, I I think about this actually, and I can't figure out why, because now it, I, I don't want to be ashamed. And I don't think that people who have gone through this should be ashamed of it or regret everything. But I'm in a place where I just regret all of it. I'm sure at some point with I'm going to continue to work and hopefully I will just be content and I'll be happy. But I just can't get over that. I would 
I would show my, I have a list of, of names in my, or either names or dis- descriptions if I didn't know the name uh, in my, in my notes app in my phone that I would show to people. I think I secretly, uh, well, everybody mm-hmm. thought it was, it was a game and the higher you are, the, the better you are, but it's, it's just not how it works. Well, that it, this is very typical of a sex addict. This number gives you a sense of high and it, it, it's like they're trophies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. That's definitely how it feels. Do you still giggle about it sometimes? And you think to yourself, let's say you're driving. I, I wish that I could. Because I just, I, I'm right now, I am so much better than I have been in the past. But I, it's something that I really don't like about myself. I know that it's not, it's not something that I should be super ashamed of. But I think it just thinking about it brings me back to a place where I was so unhappy with myself. And I, all I did was, do things that made me more and more unhappy and I I was just in so much pain at the time that I think thinking about it now brings me back to that feeling if that makes sense when you talk about you were in so much pain was it the incident is it what happened to you was it your father was it what happened to you when uh, you were in high school, you could was it you just couldn't put a, your finger on it? Could you identify what was hurting you so much? Because by the time we got to the boyfriend, guy number three, mm-hmm. you chose that guy because of how you were feeling. So mm-hmm. even though he traumatized you and he was an asshole and, and treated you like shit, you still stuck, you know, you still, you still stayed in the relationship, obviously fear of rejection, but these are all, this is all just behavior patterns. So we, so that's not a route at the time you may have thought, okay, he fucked me over. I'm going to go out and, you know, have sex with all these guys and make myself feel better. But before you even got there, where, what was the suffering, if you don't mind my asking, or or just, or you don't even have to share, but can you identify what was making you sad or what was hurting you so deeply? I would say a combination of everything. Um, but it, yeah, I, I would say definitely my dad passing away did send me spiraling and I never really, I was in therapy for years, but I never really dealt with my issues. And I would say what happened in high school made things worse as well. And also I would say another part of it was for, you know, 10 years after my dad passed away, I watched my mom date and my mom dated just the worst guys. Mm. She, now she, we're talking. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't see it at first, of course. I mean, because you never do. But she put up with a lot from men and she got treated so terribly. So I think also that reflected how I thought a guy, or I thought all men were. Because, I mean, my dad was fantastic to my mom. They were, he was a great guy. But I didn't remember seeing that much of that. And I just thought this was the dating pool. This is what it's like. Well, how about this is how I'm supposed to behave? I think that's what you learn. You see mom and you're like, oh, that's what I'm supposed to do when a guy treats me like shit. I always ask my clients, what were you taught love was? And a lot of people can't answer that question. And I love where you keep on going back and saying, I don't want to feel shame about myself. I don't want to feel shameful. That is so important because uh, you're on a life journey and you're discovering yourself and you're finding yourself and life happens. You can heal from that and live free of that by choices. Anybody who has experienced anything similar, they can expect shame for the most. I, Mm -hmm. I can't speak about all cases, but I would say most cases 
there you are going to have a step where you are out of it and but all you feel is shame guilt embarrassment whatever but I also am starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel I'm starting to see that I can get over that and I keep trying to make sure I, I keep that in my mind anytime I do start feeling those feelings that it's temporary and I'm moving out of it and I'm doing things in my own life to make myself happy to make myself like who I am this is this is I wrote this down I wanted to make sure that I mention this your patterns your behavior patterns let's just say that mimic mm-hmm. walk talk of uh, where you might have love addiction issues tend to measure their self-worth on external this is college girls specifically uh and i think just girls this age group tend mm-hmm. to measure their self-worth on external things how they look what they wear and most importantly on how much someone wants or needs them in my friend group too specifically there there was one girl who would always, if we say I, I hooked up with a guy and she would always say something like, oh yeah, I, you know, I, I, he texted me, oh, this just Mm -hmm. so it didn't feel like a loss for her, you know, just so it felt like you, you just got him because I didn't want him, Mm -hmm. which I also understand that that's coming from insecurity. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, when I asked you, I'm like, okay, we got to do an interview. You came in. This was another time you came in after you were going for revenge. You come in, you look totally different than the first time that I saw you. And you're you're there and you're talking about, I'm like, so what are you in here for now? And you're saying, oh, you know, I'm out there. I mean, you were just high on yourself. You literally looked high on yourself. <laughs> and And so... We're standing there and you're talking about, um, we start talking about STDs and you're standing there and you say how the guys are trying to convince you that they don't need to wear a condom because they're not going to come inside of you or get you pregnant or that you can trust them. And I'll never forget you turned around and you were like, it's me they got to worry about. I'm the one with the STD. <laughs> Put a condom on. <laughs> I, th- I thought it's just a switch on these dudes out there that think that they're trying to convince some girl to trust them. And, you know, everybody needs to be wearing, you know, protecting themselves for, for lots of reasons. But that's that's an impression in my mind. <laughs> of you that I'll probably never forget <laughs> because yeah that that was true I I do remember that time and luckily I I've actually as soon as I came out of this headspace I got kind of obsessed with getting tested I got tested probably 10 times in two months and it have I did it multiple times a week for a little like mm-hmm. it, it was it, I and luckily, I did never have anything besides chlamydia, but um, still embarrassing to talk about, but I, it does feel better to get it out. <laughs> you mentioned, yeah, it does, though, because we got we to gotta be honest. We got we to gotta talk about everything here. Uh, so there was also something that you said that, my God. So I had a couple of other girls that came in and I was telling them about you and they really wanted to listen to this episode uh, because when I told them about it, the looks on their faces were like, oh my God, she's, that's me. Like they wanted to listen to learn more about themselves, really. Mm-hmm. So uh, you said something also about this time in, in girls' lives, college girls' lives, where you meet somebody and you don't know if you should be friends. Maybe you're attracted to them. Maybe you're just two attractive people. Um, you get along and you don't know if you shouldn't sleep with them or you, or you just go ahead and sleep with them because you're hanging out and then you just go have sex with them. And But you don't know, like, should I have just been their friend or were we starting a friendship or that doesn't mean that he liked me and I didn't even like him. Why did I have sex with him? Definitely. That's happened to me multiple times, but I 
And I think it was both me and the guy. We got our, our, we got attraction and friendship confused. And we thought the fact that we liked each other, we liked hanging out with each other meant that it meant we were attracted to each other with we realize now it doesn't, but I mean, there, there, there are some of my friendships that we had to overcome the fact that we had either slept together or talked about it or whatever, or even there were friendships that it just kind of ruined that could have been really great ones. So it, it does get very confusing. But this is also a trait of a love addict. Mm-hmm. Confusing being needed with being loved or if they feel needed or wanted they think that it's love so they cave mm-hmm. uh, and even you know like you were talking about it, the friend thing and then mm-hmm. you just end up sleeping with somebody because yeah you're confused mm-hmm. well you know you're stepping out into the world you're over 18 you're not under your parents guidance and let me ask you this would have anything have helped you are prevented. You said that you were in therapy. Would anything have helped uh, change any of this? Were you taught self love? Um, I I don't know that anything I learned from living through this I could have um, learned from anything else from you True. know. Maybe, maybe from example, yes, maybe an example of if my mom had set that example, but you know, we just kind of, her and I are very similar. We have a lot of the same issues. And I think that just means that I've reflected hers, but. Does she, does she practice self-love? Do you see her in a place where she practices self-love? Has the confidence of self-love and the self-love I, value? I don't know. I don't feel like I see it that often in her I wish I I wish I saw it more Mm -hmm. um I think I had to I had to live through this Mm -hmm. to learn to to learn to overcome all of it and to learn about myself Mm -hmm. because there were years where I I wouldn't say I, I wasn't ever suicidal but I there were t- years where I just didn't care if I survived or not. You know, I wouldn't, I remember thinking if, you know, oh, if, if that car just hit me, I, it'd be fine. I wouldn't care. I don't want it to, but if it did, it's whatever, because I don't feel, I didn't feel like I had a life to look forward to. And that was all throughout elementary, later elementary, middle school, high school, and all through throughout college as well but now I'm finally in a place where I again I see the light at the end of the tunnel and I feel like I have a future that I can be happy about I am going to run through a sex addiction definition just for the listeners Uh, it's the active Uh use uh, because I know people are like what if she just likes to have sex what if I just like to have sex doesn't mean I'm a sex addict Mm -hmm. Uh, So the active use of a sexual behavior, whether it is masturbation, uh, internet porn, addiction, fetishes, and or behavior with self or others in a compulsive life-destroying pattern. The difference between somebody who has a naturally high sex drive versus somebody who is a sex addict or in this behavior pattern is the mental well-being and harmful consequences. Mm -hmm. Um, 80% of those who struggle with sex addiction have abandonment, abuse, or neglect issues of some type. I'll leave article, links to articles and any information uh, for everybody so that you can just have a quick reference and be able to educate yourself or learn a little bit more, share it with somebody, whatever the case may be. This is something that, you know, I'm really glad that we were able to talk about this and be super honest and the listeners get to you know listen to your story maybe they identify with it maybe a parent out there has somebody 
has a, has kids that are getting ready to go off to school, if they let them listen to the episode, I think that the information is there for them to understand, be able to like see the patterns and go, that's what she was talking about. I'm doing it or, you know, that's what I feel like. What mm-hmm. made you stop? I, I, I'm not even sure. I think I had been trying to do AA for a couple months, but then, I mean, I would get like three days, but then my friends would want to go to a really cool bar that I couldn't miss going to for the 50th time. You know, I could not miss Mm -hmm. whatever was going on. And, and I would go into, I would go to these meetings every day and I, I would go to the same ones and I got embarrassed about having to stand up for being in your first 30 days for, you know, three months or something Mm -hmm. and saying my, my day count was two, three days every single time I went. And I realized that nothing was going, I knew for a long time that I needed a change and I had issues, but I just wasn't willing to make the change for myself. But I finally decided I, I can't do it. I live with my mom now and um and it feels it feels really good. I'm a huge self-love um advocate. You can shed all of the shame that you were talking about uh, is attached to you and um move forward with self-respect and grow self-esteem. And just being able to reflect and look around and say, I can't be in this environment. I need to change my environment so that Mm -hmm. my behavior patterns change. Like that's huge. Yeah. I I would say the people in the meetings as well. If I, everybody who's in it says it just goes on and on about how great it is. And that's kind of why I was a little bit turned off of uh, AA for a little while, because I would just go to these meetings and people would just talk about how fantastic it is. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't feeling that. Right. But it really is. And and everyone understands, you know, you you haven't been through the exact same thing as them, but they understand why we act the way we do. And they're willing to share their stories and help you understand why you've acted the way you do and how to get, get past it, get past the shame, regret, and well, one stop then two get past the shame and regret and make amends for all you've wronged and things like that. So I think that was also a really big part of it was that they would kind of say to me in meeting, they would always welcome me back, but they would kind of say, decide whether you want to do this or not. Something along the lines of that. And I, and yeah, it it really did help. Uh, All of my artwork, I call myself the expressionist. Uh, Even this podcast was a result of me facing myself finally to at a point in life where you just to heal from the trauma from my childhood and choices that I had made. I was on a power trip. I was a man eater. Uh, um, it is, you know, you think that you're in power. You think that you're all of that. You think, you know, you're in control, but you're really not. And mm-hmm. true empowerment really comes from facing yourself having peace with yourself, loving yourself and making decisions that, like you said, like you feel really good about where you're at. You're honoring yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's where, if we could just get to that place, no matter where you are out in the world, listeners, if we all get there where we just got to like put everything down and go, I got to take care of myself. I have made some bad decisions or ones that I'm not proud of, or I wish my life, I thought my life would be different than what it is now, whatever the case may be. You know, if you're using anything to cope, when you have one addiction, it's very typical for you to have a couple of different addictions. Mm -hmm. So it's just the behavior patterns of trying to escape from pain and the shame again, anxiety, anything like that. So when you get to a point where you choose yourself above everything and love yourself and start facing yourself, then, then you are really, really, really walking in 
your power and you get to where it is that you want want to be and where you need to be. I highly recommend the book, The Truth by Neil Strauss. And uh, I mentioned that to you when we talked as an incredible book. And Out of the Shadows by Patrick Carnes. He is like the leading sex addiction expert. Again, that doesn't mean everybody out there is a sex addict. I mean, a lot of people are, but or they're using sex. But uh, there's so many patterns that when you start reading about this stuff, there is a part of you in them and it helps you kind of face yourself and go, wow, you know, I, I do that or I think that way or I feel that way. And if that's where you're at, then just read a little bit more. That's all you got to do. Educate yourself a little bit more and you'll, you'll get to the root. Finding out what the root is and, have, and dealing with the root is where all the suffering kind of stops because you're dealing with it. So you moved out, you started your life again. You wouldn't have made those choices had you been drinking, but you also wouldn't have learned what it is that you needed to learn. You said exactly what message do you have for girls out there that in college or high school, even? I would say definitely if you want to go have fun, have a good time, but be wary of the fact that the wild side, the fun, the parties can consume you like it did me. And not to say that it will. There's certainly a lot of people who can just have their party phase and then get over it with no problem. But mm-hmm. for people like me, it, it can easily consume you and you won't notice. Which Love and Lies episode did you listen to? I ask everybody this question because I'm always curious. Um, when you found out about the podcast, what which um, episode did you listen to? The first episode I listened to was um, the one that was a divorce lawyer. Oh. I'm not sure why I picked it, but I, I looked at all the titles and I thought that's what I wanted to listen to. And I don't remember the details, but I remember really liking it. I thought it was really interesting. Oh, that's and incredible. It, had, it had a take on, well, on a lot of things that I haven't really seen before. Nice. But I, I felt was true. What, um, I asked these three questions of every guest. Where is the love in your story? The love is where I am now being able to love yourself. You know what? As long as I've been doing this, I think maybe one person has given me a different answer. Everybody else has absolutely said that it has, it is um, finding themselves loving themselves. Anybody listening, you just, whatever you're going through, may not even going through any of this shit, but I know you're going through something. Self-love mm-hmm. is the answer. And where's the lies in your story? The lie is pretty much I lying to myself constantly. I, I would even say back 10 years, for the last 10 years, I, I lied to myself about I had no future or I had nothing to be happy about or I could, you know, I... I like who I was that kind of that um I would say the lie is not not pursuing self-love lying to myself about what was making me happy because I I thought all of these decisions that I was making were things that were making me happier they were fun cool but now I I've seen the light and I I don't think that anymore what is the truth the truth is, it kind of sounds cliche, but you can really be whatever you want to be. You can, if you want to be that confident girl, you can decide to do it. You know, if you, you there's so many opportunities in life that we, I was for so long scared of, of how many options I had that I just decided, oh, I'm not going to do any of them. I'm just going to party. <laughs> But the truth is that you can be happy about the, all the possibilities in the future, the future holds. So you're happier and you find fulfillment in your days 
in your work, everything it is that you do, more fulfillment than you ever found with the partying and trying to be accepted and being picked and the drinking. Definitely. Thank you so much. I appreciate you taking the time out for this. I know it's going to help a lot of people and it's just going to comfort them. They're not alone. Everybody feels like they're the only. Did you feel like you were the only one? Oh, absolutely. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. All this right. was fantastic. All right, ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. The truth. <laughs>